Good morning, NSCBC. Welcome. Welcome to NSCBC. We're glad you could join us. Welcome, NSCBC. We miss you and welcome you to worship this day that the Lord has made. Amen. Good morning, NSCBC. Good morning, NSCBC. Welcome from Gordon Conwell. <laughs> well, welcome everyone to our live stream this Sunday morning, wherever you're watching from and all of your scattered homes and house churches throughout the North Shore. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. We often say as a church that we are just ordinary people, people who have been united together by this extraordinary hope that we have because of Jesus, and we're being transformed by his gospel every day, and we're called to live on mission together. You could almost call this our family charter or purpose statement. In fact, one of the metaphors that the New Testament uses most often to describe the church is that the church is a family. We're a family that has a loving father over us and a sacrificial older brother named Jesus with us. And we're a family that has a family culture of self-giving love. And we have a shared family mission that we embark on together. And so actually when someone is added to the church, they are added to a family by grace. And so this morning, we're going to be exploring and singing and preaching about this theme that God calls us into a family. And this could be a, a bit of a special service that we've really been excited for for quite a while because we're going to get to hear later in the service some stories of people who were recently baptized, which is this rite that uh, publicly demonstrates being added into God's family. And then we're also going to hear later in the service from uh, one of the pastors of our sister churches, Pastor Brian Carlson, who serves as the lead pastor of Antioch Community Church right down the road in Beverly. And he's going to be preaching to us about the implications of God calling us into a family, including why we demonstrate his gospel through foster care. So we hope that you're encouraged by this morning. We're thankful for you for joining us. Will you read this verse for me? from the Gospel of John to call us to worship. This verse talks about the privilege that it is to be children in God's family. John says, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Let's worship together in song.
we are learning to be a church family who really prays. And so we're going to take these next few minutes to pray together as a church family to our Father, according to the, the model prayer that Jesus gave us in the Lord's Prayer. And so if you're uh, watching this by yourself, you might just want to personalize these prayers and pray according to these prompts out loud wherever you are. Or if you're watching this as a family or in a house church, take these next few seconds to kind of physically reposition yourselves like Sarah directed us to do last week so that you're actually uh, facing each other and you can see each other as we pray. This will help to kind of uh, physically reinforce this fact that we are praying as a family and as a community and together bringing our request to God. So we'll have about three to four minutes to do this. There will be a few prompts on the screen that I'll lead us in and just have someone in your group uh, choose to jump in and pray these prayers out loud to God and then I'll close us in prayer. So let's pray together, church. We pray for God's kingdom to come. Pray for God's kingdom to come to the North Shore through church planting and for his kingdom to come to our world as well. We pray for our daily bread. Pray for needs that you know of in our church family and pray that God would provide families and homes for children in the foster care system as well. Finally, we ask for forgiveness. Confess to God the ways that we have failed in our witness to the gospel, either individually or as a whole church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, church, we can have confidence that our prayers and our confessions have been heard, not because of the words that we use, but because we pray as a children to a Father who loves us. Uh, John said encouragingly in his first epistle, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. And so as we sing this next song about who God says we are, this song of declaring our identity in Jesus, I want you to think about how everything that we sing that's true of us as individuals is also true of the people you're singing with in your family. And so you might want to even look at the people you're singing with if you're in a house church and think about this shared identity we have in Jesus. Let's sing again together. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the song sets free. Oh, it's free. continue singing together and this next song is a new one that you might recognize from last week so if you still feel like you're learning it that's okay I encourage you to jump in and sing along with us so let's continue worshiping together what is our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our
We now have the chance to see four really encouraging stories and videos of people in our church who were recently baptized. Baptism, which is one of our ordinances as a church, is a vivid physical demonstration of what happens spiritually when someone becomes a Christian. We sometimes call this conversion as Christians. Baptism uh, involves fully immersing people underwater and then bring them up again to communicate a complete death and a complete resurrection. Becoming a Christian, in other words, is not simply uh, about uh, embarking on a program of self-improvement. No, uh, becoming a Christian is all about rewinding the tape all the way back to birth and saying, you know, my problem has been with me since birth. I need a whole new way of relating to God. And so just like Jesus uh, physically died and literally rose from the dead, so we too, who are united to him as Christians, we die, as it were, to a whole way of living and a whole way of making our way through this world. We die to uh, resting and trusting in ourselves as our own Savior, and we die to allowing ourselves to be our own Lord, to call the shots in our life. And just like Jesus rose from the dead, so we who are united to him rise again to a whole way of relating to him in this world. Now, instead of trusting in ourselves as Savior that we're good enough, that our pedigree, that our good attitude is enough, we trust in Jesus' finished work as Savior. And now, instead of allowing ourselves to be the Lord of our lives, to call the shots, to make the plans, we now say, no, Jesus, you are the Lord, you are the leader of my life and I want to follow you. And so this is a beautiful physical picture of the way that God has worked in these people's lives to claim them as, as his savior uh, and to be their Lord. And so we hope you're encouraged by these videos of people who are being added to our family.
My name is Jake. I've been uh, in the Air Force now for eight and a half years. I've lived in Gloucester the last three years. Um, growing up, we had a lot of cultural influence. Uh, I had a lot of Christian friends. And um, I don't know, it was a relatively tame childhood. You know, there's sad parts, there's happy parts. Um, joined the Air Force at 19. And once I kind of got away from like my environment and all that stuff, you're gonna get like pulled out and like, like go make friends and like survive in life. Um, I did rely on God initially, but um, there was just a point and I, I forget where it was or what happened. There wasn't any event that happened. I just stopped. I just was like, I got it, you know? And uh, I didn't, by the way, but uh, you know, I, I just started doing things my way. And, um, you know, honestly, I didn't really have a lot of the tools to function as an adult. I, uh, one of the things I would do all the time is like victimize myself. I was very mm. self pitying, you know, I would look at like circumstance, like things like, oh, this, this thing slightly didn't go this way. Why does it never work out for me? You know, and uh, it's just wasting a lot of time and a lot of energy focusing on self. Anyways, to help deal with a lot of that stuff, to essentially put the blinders on, it seemed like I started increasing my consumption of alcohol. And um, yeah, it was a very uh, short term solution to like my spiritual problem. And so it started to get worse. I started to just do things I didn't think I would do. Um, I was like dishonest, you know, I was like lying about things. And um, I just didn't like to be that kind of person, you know, I didn't, I knew it was wrong. And it started to feel pretty bad. It was pretty bad to be me. And so I reached out for some help. And, uh, you know, they're like, hey, we, you might be drinking too much. Let's just look at AA. And so I went into the program. And, um, you know, one of the things they teach you in there is that you have to uh, stop being self-reliant. You have to stop making all the decisions based on self-will. You have to rely on a higher power, which um, is great. It's like awesome however the next thing you have to do <laughs> is look at yourself and how your actions have caused the problems in your life and that is very hard to do mm. self-reflection and you know i realized by doing that though like oh shoot god wasn't causing all this problem in my life it was me you know choosing to be selfish every day every moment you know what serves me the best and it's funny by serving myself I was essentially making life extremely hard for me. Mm. And that's one of the gifts from like choosing God, choosing to serve God, choosing to align my will with God is like, I don't have to worry about myself, you know? I, all that, mm. that burden is taken from me. God's got it, you know what I mean? I just need to do the right next right thing. The next right thing that God wants me to do in the moment. Which like, self-will still creeps in there, but nowhere near what it used to, you know what I mean? And then I have all this I don't know, but you would feel it serenity uh, from doing what God wants me to do. So I needed a more concrete set of guidelines and I realized like, they gave us that Bible, you know, God gave us that in the Bible. So I started reaching out to Sam and he started hammering home a lot of these points and I had to make these changes in my life and it was not easy to do, but my life is better for it, you know. Hmm. God's like, got more glory from it you know I, I get the chance to come and share my story with you guys you know and hopefully it helps somebody you know <laughs> if anything I feel a little bit better um and uh so Sam you know started teaching me about the bible I started taking it upon myself to read it and discover my faith and uh I realized I needed to get baptized Sam performed the service and um you know I've been here at a church a few times I don't, I don't know how many but uh Every time I've come, it's been a warm welcome, you know, and that's, I love that, you know, I love kind of being part of, uh, that's one of the things when you're doing your own thing is it's just you, you know, you're alone. And I, I just very much appreciate the fact that I've kind of been accepted into this community. So I wouldn't say easily, but yeah, you know, really easily. What would you say now is the hardest part of following Christ as you were surrendering every day 
and that's the thing is you I, I don't want to say you have to because there's no have to things it's a choice and that's like that's what I've realized more than anything is I have to choose God every day or I'll go back you know I, I know what that life's like you know and I can choose that anytime I want I just I remember those feelings, you know, it's not too far away from me. I've got like almost three years now without drugs or alcohol and um, I just don't want that loneliness. I feel also like I turn my back on these people, these this, this family, these friendships. You make friendships and stuff out there, but it's not real. None of it's real. It's all contrived. People are just trying to get something from someone else. And here it's real. It's it's eternal, you know, it's like a reflection of God's selfless love, you know, people don't get anything out of being friends with me, they just choose to because it's like reflecting of God's selflessness love, and um, it's, I wouldn't want anything else, you know, it's otherworldly, it's not, it's not material at all, I, I absolutely love it. So Hannah, you, uh, you know, shared, you, you know, you grew up in the church, um, and a lot of times people will say, uh, hey, I feel like I don't have this amazing story. Just to encourage you, that is an amazing story. That's how Christianity is supposed to work. God's parents share the gospel with their kids. They believe in it, uh, and then they grow in their understanding as his disciples of what it means to have the word of God. So tell us uh, a little more, uh, for those who are going to be watching this later, about yourself and what makes you want to declare your faith publicly at this time? Yeah. Um, well, like you said, I have grown up in the church and um, I've been a professing Christian for pretty much as long as I can remember and I um, received the Lord as my Savior at a very, very young age, pretty much as soon as I could kind of grasp what it meant that Jesus died for our sins. Um, and I've always had this knowledge and this understanding that baptism was an important step of obedience and faith in the life of a believer and I always had a desire to do it um, but just my life's journey sort of took me through um, a series of just kind of going from church to church and it wasn't until recently that I really felt um, that I was able to um, plant my own roots in a church community um, here and it was at that point that I realized that the time is right and perhaps even um, a bit overdue to um, make that profession of um, a commitment that I've held to my life. Um, and obviously as an adult now, I've um, been able to grow my understanding of what that means and the significance of um, being united with Christ and just how the Lord has saved me and um, uh, how he's worked in my life. Um, awesome. Um, we, like we had talked about earlier, you know, part of all of what you just described means that you are orienting yourself towards uh, a savior, a rescuer, and not only you know have you received his grace in a decisive way that's brought you into his kingdom, but you need to continually trust in him for his uh, grace for you. So wh where's an area right now or two where you sense the need for God's grace? Yeah, um, well, I, you know, I sense my need for God's grace in different ways every day. But um, I think one way that could be maybe a theme for me is um, just the grace to let go of control um, and to let God be in control. Um, and if you'd asked me, you know, a few months ago, I might have um, talked about that in relation to work and to my job and um, letting go of control of what I thought, you know, my career was supposed to look like or um, um, sort of grasping for agency and understanding why I was where I was and trying to understand the purpose, um, but God taught me a lot about just trusting in um, the fact that He has a purpose for it and He's in control. Um, and nowadays it's probably more in relation to um, wedding planning and planning um, my new life um, since I've been married for just a few days. Um, but yeah, just um, just um, asking God for the grace to um, let go when things don't go as expected or or as planned, um, and um, not to allow my need for things to be right or perfect by my own 
difficulties in this, um, to counteract my ability to be a vessel of grace to others. So good. And then finally, where do you sense uh, the calling to follow Jesus as well in this season? Yeah. So the next season of my life starts on Friday, like I as I said. So it's obviously a major life transition. But um, so I so I um, know that the Lord is calling me as well as Gabe to um, be an example of Christ's um, unconditional and covenantal love for the church um, to show that forth to the world. Um, but for me specifically, just to um, trust Him wholeheartedly in this season and um, to not be wise in my own eyes or um, lean on my own understanding, but to um, submit my whole to the Lord's system. Also encouraging, guys. Let's go ahead and do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hannah, have you received Jesus as your Savior? Yes. And having received Him as your Savior, is it your desire to follow Him as your Lord? Follow upon your own profession of faith, Hannah. It's my pleasure, my joy. Baptism, grace to walk in newness of life. <laughs>
first I just want to say thank you for everyone coming here. I really didn't think we'd see as many people coming, so that's great. Um, second of all, I'm sorry if I'm not as good at speaking as Joe is. He's, he's, got, he's got a lot more experience than this thing is, so, um, but uh, I'll start. Um, so, um, so it was all started a few years ago when uh, God put Joe and I's path on to each other as, uh, as neighbors, next door neighbor, by saying like, you know, if anyone here has like, um, you know, are new to an area or there's someone that's a neighbor that's new to their area or just someone that like, hey, I've lived in the same place for five or 10 or 15 years, I've never got to know this person. You know, maybe you can like hear Joe and I's story and kind of like say, you know what, I'm gonna go up to that person. I'm gonna just knock on their door, see, making a point to see them outside and, and just say, you know, hey, how you doing? I'm, you know, if you introduce yourself. So, um, so back to our story then. Um, so yes, yeah, so Joe and I, uh, Joe nervously asked me, so about, about a year after we had met, we became friends, and Joe nervously asked me uh, if he wanted to meet up once a week and, um, and talk about the Bible. And, you know, I jumped at the chance, you know, Joe's a great guy, and get, get to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with him was, it really seemed like something that was fun to do. And, um, and also he was putting his time out there to say, hey, you know, I got a boatload of kids and, you know, a job and everything that I'm doing, but I can dedicate some time to you if you want to dedicate some time to me. So, you know, it really meant a lot to me. Um, so every week we, uh, like I said, we met up and read the Bible and the uh, first chapter that we, uh, the first book that we read was Mark. And um, in the beginning of Mark, um, Jesus took his disciples to a man's home and the disciples were in shock because of who the man was. He was someone, it was a, he was a tax collector and he was a disliked tax collector. And, um, you know, so they were like, like I said, aghast by it. And in Mark 2.17, Jesus said that, that he came for the people who needed him for the most, not for the people that needed him the least. And that man later became one of his disciples. It was then that I realized that I was one of the ones that needed God the most. I had worked in jobs where it was celebrated when I would cheat someone out of money. And the way to make more money was to cheat me. From this, money began, began to consume me and it was all that I would worry about. Um, but I had taken a huge leap recently and left that career. And it was 100% God that led me to what I do today in my new profession. So many times in my life I've worried about um, my finances, my relationships, my career, my health. And every time I get that immense feeling of stress where it feels like the walls are caving in on you, God was always there for me. Uh, he was always there. He was there to carry me when I couldn't walk. There's another story in Mark, Mark 3. When Jesus was, a home, was in a home with a crowd similar to like this one, and he was interrupted with the, with the uh, news that his mother and brothers had arrived, and they were outside. Jesus proclaimed that anyone that, who was a believer in God was part of his family. So everyone in front of him teachings of Jesus when it was convenient for me. Most of the time, I was present, but sometimes I can't be that person who's constantly letting down my family.
ready for Frankie now. Dear Father, we just celebrate you and what you have done in this man's life. We thank you so much for the grace of God. We just ask that right now with this commitment that you have made in his heart, that Father, you would bring him along Well, what an encouragement. Wherever you are, take these next few minutes to either reflect on or if you're in a group, uh, discuss with each other what encouraged you from what you just heard. And then maybe have a person or two uh, return thanks to God in prayer for the way that He is working in our church.
And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Hey, North Shore Community Baptist Church. It's an honor to be with you this morning. Uh, So grateful for your partnership in the gospel in Beverly, and even more for the ways that you've invested in my life. Uh, I've eaten at some of your tables. Uh, You have loved on my kids. Some of you have trained me in ministry and others have just prayed for me and and been longtime dear, dear friends. And so I'm so grateful to be with you this morning and be able to preach the word to you. Thanks for having me. I have a couple friends who grew up as MKs, and that stands for Missionary Kids. So their parents were missionaries in foreign countries, and at an early age, uh, both of these friends of mine Uh, left their families and went to a boarding school about the age of five or six. And uh, they had actually very mixed experiences. One of these friends, I remember remarking to me years ago, said, Brian, if you ever have the chance to put your kids in a boarding school, do it. It was an amazing experience. And he went on to share about all the friendships that he formed and time with peers and life in a dorm that for him was a wonderful experience. Uh, This other friend had the opposite experience, and for him it was uh, an experience of feeling abandoned and ended up being more of a traumatic experience for him and not uh, a real positive one, although there were plenty of positive things within that. The question I want to ask today is, what is God's perspective on family? So in light of the gospel, what does it look like for us to relate to God, to our families, and to those in and out, even outside of the 
family of God himself. And here's what we're going to find today. Jesus is a family man. Now, I know what you're thinking, because you just heard the scripture read. You might be thinking, Brian, what are you talking about Jesus as a family man? I mean, he just, in this passage that we read, was, was pushing away his mother and his brothers. Well, here's the first thing that really this passage is trying to communicate. And that is this, that God calls us into a family. And it's a family that looks more and more like our Father. See, Jesus in this passage is really saying, hey, people that do the will of God, they are my mother, brother, and sister. So it's not the emphasis as much on, hey, I'm pushing away my mother and brothers who are calling for my attention. Jesus is just taking that circumstance to say, hey, I actually am a family man, and I have a very large family that I am calling people into, the people that do what my Father in heaven wills. And this is is an amazing statement, that Jesus, who is God, is a family man, that he is actually calling us not as servants or not as little worker bees, but he is actually calling us into a family family relationship with him. What a profound statement of what the Christian faith is really about. It's about a family. And that's what we see in the gospel. The gospel is all about God getting his family back. God becomes a person because this world was lost, because the family members that God had turned their backs on him, walked away from him. And so God enters the the world as a human being in the person of Jesus, perfectly exemplifies and reveals what God is really like and what the family values and the family culture of heaven is all about. He, He refuses the agendas of those around him to take power by force or to use violence to the point where he, he, he gives up his own life at the hands of wicked men. And then, of course, as, as you're familiar with, Jesus is raised from the dead and defeats death itself so that now forever he is the ultimate family man drawing people into the family of God as they put their faith in him and receive the grace and forgiveness that is offered in the family of heaven. That's the picture of the gospel, that Jesus is a family man. He's calling people into family relationships. Now, the second aspect of that is is just that what Jesus is saying is, hey, families resemble each other. We have a one-year-old daughter, Flora, who's our youngest of four. And uh, earlier this year, kind of, you know, in the winter months, my wife and I were in our den watching her play and she began to do this motion where she would grab a toy in front of her and without looking, just put it behind her back and then grab another one and place it behind her back, which was exactly the same motion that her eldest brother did when he was that age. Our jaws just dropped and I just was dumbfounded that a movement like that could be genetic. It's unbelievable. Our two middle siblings, our two middle kids, they didn't do that at all. So it wasn't like she saw them doing it. It was totally the same thing. And then she started doing the same thing when she would hand you something. She would hand you a a toy or object and she would immediately put her hands on her chest. And again, that was exactly what our oldest son Samuel used to do when he was that age. Just unbelievable what genetics can do in family resemblance. And that's just an emotion that a kid is doing, let alone how our kids look, because you know, people look at them and say, oh, there's another Carlson, you know, when they see our, see our fourth child. People are always talking about, oh, who does this person look like? What relative and families? And then, of course, that's just the nature side, but the whole nurture side of, you know, families have sayings that they use and gestures and expressions. You know, families just you know, look like one another. And that's what Jesus is tapping into here. 
He's not saying, well, it's just the people that obey and they're the ones that, you know, really are a part of my family. That's taken it the wrong way. I was reading a book uh, earlier this month. It's called Renovated by this guy named Jim Wilder, and it's about uh, brain science and Dallas Willard's kind of spiritual formation theology and trying to bring that all together with a, a scientific perspective. And the point of the whole book is really to say that salvation is actually a new attachment. You know, kids bond with their parents and form attachment with their parents in a healthy uh, environment. And that's what this author is saying is that really, hey, Hesed love and agape, it's really talking about a bond with God. And that those that we bond with are the people or the ones that we become like. We attach to the ones that feed us. And those that we attach to is who we actually glean our culture and our relational and emotional capacity from. And it's the same thing in the family of God. Salvation is a new attachment. It is leaving the attachments of this world to idols and to things that would, would pull us down and primarily attaching to God as our father and parent so that we can then, from an early you know, age, a new, a new birth, we can learn the cultural family values of heaven and therefore look like our father and smell like our brother Jesus and sound just like Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about family. And of course, families are like each other because they are bonded and attached to one another because they're around each other and abiding and remaining with one another. And that's where our obedience to Jesus comes from. It comes from a place of attachment and bonding and abiding and a place of we love and we obey because he first loved us. That's how it works in a family. The parents are first loving on the kids. The parents are filled with grace and forgiveness for their kids. The, the parents are just trying to gently and, and, and with wisdom train and discipline and disciple their kids. And it's the same thing that Jesus is saying here because, guys, Jesus is a family man. And he and the Father and Holy Spirit are calling us to be a family. Not primarily workers, not servants in his little business. No, we are family first. And any service or work or obedience or giving flows out of a heart of, of love that has been first received and then given back to God. That's the first thing we see. Now, secondly, I just want to say that Jesus is not anti-family here. He's not saying in this passage, you know, neglect the people in your family. Because obviously other places in Scripture, we don't see that. You know, Paul talks about, hey, you know, whoever doesn't care for their own family and even especially their own household, is worse than an unbeliever. Jesus is on the cross in agony, and he's saying, John, you know, here's your mother. And so he's taking care of, of his mother even, even while he's on the cross. And you know, fathers giving instruction to you know, nurture and admonition in the Lord for their children. So this passage, I just want you to hear, Jesus is not anti-family. He is the greatest family man of all. And as followers of Jesus, we want to be family men and women who are bringing up our own children as well as investing in this larger family of faith. And the, th the third thing that we see in this passage, guys, is just that God's family is ever growing and shaping the world around us. And that is because Jesus is always calling more people into his family and that family in turn starts to bring the culture of heaven the values of God's family to bear on the world. And that's what we, we, we saw today in these baptism testimonies. Uh, this, is, this is like an initiation into God's family. It's like, it's like a quinceanera, right, for, for entering into, into you know, this full participation in the family of God. And that's why the Bible uses this language of being born again or being a new creation, or being adopted into a family. It's all this kind of familial type of language that's describing that, hey, you are being brought into a family because Jesus is a family man. God is calling us to act like a family together. It is a family that more and more we reflect the character of God because we're bonding and attached to him through shared experience and love and faith and trusting God. And then we're, we're welcoming others into that midst. And that's what baptism is all about. It's saying, hey, 
Welcome to the family. <clears throat> and listen, God's family is also shaping the world. Just as every individual family has traditions and uh, you know, rituals and values and, and habits that they form, the same is true for the family of God. We are called to bring the culture and the values of heaven to everything and everywhere that we go, whether it's in your place of work, uh, whether it's in your own family, uh, wherever you might find yourself, your neighborhood, it is you being God's representative as a family member and bringing the culture of this heavenly family into that place. And this is a huge reason why the church in this area, under the leadership we believe of the Holy Spirit, has led us into this foster care initiative. And man, it's an amazing picture itself of the gospel. Right? That as we bring these little ones into our homes, we are actually picturing the gospel of God has how he has adopted us into his family and then is now training and growing us up to attach and bond with him so we can learn the family values and then do the will of our Father in this world. And so that's a huge reason why we value foster care and we want to encourage people to be foster parents or to support those who are or to support intact families in this area. It's, it's, it's us saying, hey, we are a family and we are welcoming people into this family and we want to share the value and culture of heaven and, and, and our Jesus this amazing brother, and God the Father, and Holy Spirit, our comforter. And hey, secondly, this is a way that we shape the world around us, by serving people from a place of no strings attached, from just loving them where they're at, and supporting families in this area. We are bringing that culture forward. So in foster care, we're both picturing the gospel by adopting or inviting people and bringing people into our literal homes. And then we're also turning outwards and, and, and sharing the values of heaven by loving the people around us with open hands, no strings attached, and just showing, hey, this is what we're all about. We want to picture the Father in heaven who gives generously right, without finding fault. So guys, it's a joy to partner with you in the gospel and just know uh, together that Jesus is a family man, that we are family, and that as family of God, we are continually more and more reflecting the character of Jesus and our Father and Holy Spirit as we attach to God and receive his love for us, put our trust in him. And he's constantly forgiving us and giving us grace and leading us along as a gentle parent. And in that, we see a picture of the gospel of what it is that Jesus is a family man and he's calling us into family with himself. God bless you all. It's a delight to be with you. Thanks, Brian. It's so great to have you with us this morning. Well, we're going to respond now with singing, Give Us Your Heart. And you'll notice that the background of the song are videos, and they're actually places over the North Shore. Uh, and the thought behind that is, as we sing this song, to sing it as a prayer over where we live, over our communities. So with that in mind, let's join in singing this song together. Your eyes are on the lowly, though others look away. Your feet run to the broken, your hands are quick to say.
Thanks for joining us this morning, church. Just a few final announcements before we go out with the benediction. First, you'll see a number of resources on the nscbc.org slash live page. You'll find uh, information about how you might give financially. There will be a Zoom link as well for a video prayer room if you'd like anyone to pray with you immediately following the service. And you'll see kids' discipleship resources on there as well. So check out that live page. Second is worship on the lawn. Next Sunday, the 18th at 4 p.m., there will be a chance to worship outdoors together on our front lawn. This will be a socially distanced uh, time to worship God through music and singing. And this is just a chance to come together and remember our corporate identity as a body, even as we've been grouping together, scattered in house churches throughout this summer and fall. So you do have to register for this, so sign up by Thursday, October 15th, and you can find that sign up on the live page. And finally is our couple's date night. This is just a chance as a church to bless and encourage you and your marriages for those of you among us who are married. We know that the pandemic has been hard on so many aspects of life, including marriage. So our hope is just by setting aside a set date, uh, some practical resources to guide you in conversation, and then some financial assistance as well, um, that you will be able to enjoy a date night uh, with a purpose together. So all you need to do is just pick a date, a Friday or Saturday, November 6th or 7th that weekend, and mark it off for a date night with your spouse. And then NSCBC will actually reimburse you up to $50 per couple, which can go towards your childcare or uh, the cost of a meal if you go out to eat. And after you sign up, uh, we will email you with more instructions, and then we'll send you a, um, a conversation kit uh, physically in the mail on the week of. So go to nscbc.org slash date night to sign up for that. We hope this blesses you. And hear now this benediction again from 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. As you go this week, church, would you go out knowing the love of your Father and would you live in light of it? Go in peace.